138. God's Son, Israel, the Typology. St. Matthew tells us of the visit of the wise men to the Christ child. And when they were departed, behold, the angel of the Lord appeareth to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise, and take the young child and his mother, and flee into Egypt, and be thou there until I bring thee word, for Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. When he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night, and departed into Egypt, and was there until the death of Herod, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Out of Egypt have I called my son. Matthew chapter 2 Verses 13 to 15. The quotation in verse 15 is from Hosea chapter 11, verse 1. When Israel was a child, then I loved him and called my son out of Egypt. What we have here is typology. Typology is much more than symbolism. In symbolism, we have a representation, an emblem standing for something else. Thus, the Isle of Minerva is symbolic of wisdom. This does not mean that an isle is itself wise, but merely that it is suggestive of wisdom and is used to symbolize or represent wisdom. There is a great deal of symbolism in the Bible, but it is not to be confused with typology which is God's predestined and developing pattern in history. To reduce typology to symbolism is to reduce much of Scripture to Neoplatonism and to convert reality into symbols. In typology, all the factors are real and historical. They represent necessary stages in the unfolding of God's revelation and His plan in history. To reduce certain stages of typology to mere symbols is to destroy the meaning of God's revelation and to convert it from history to Neoplatonic emblems, to shadows on the wall of Plato's cave. Thus, first, as we examine the typology of Christ as Israel, we must recognize the totally valid and historical meaning of Hosea chapter 11 verse 1. Its meaning is that God adopted Israel when Israel was a child. Moreover, at the time of its adoption, which was an act of sovereign grace, Israel was in bondage, in slavery to Egypt. God's election of Israel as his chosen people, his son, was an act of grace. This grace was manifested in love and instruction, in law and protection, but Israel proved itself a prodigal and wayward son. The whole of the Old Testament is God's record of His grace, mercy and judgment to His chosen people Israel. We cannot underrate the importance of Israel's election as God's son by adoption. Israel was much more than a symbol or emblem of the son to come. Israel was God's son by adoption. Second, Jesus Christ came as a natural son of God, supernatural in birth as very God of very God and very man of very man. Like Israel of old, he too went into Egypt for a time to be protected but without bondage. His bondage was the burden of being the new Adam called to redeem his people from the worldwide Egypt of sin, of the fall. God called his adopted son Israel out of Egypt, but Israel carried Egypt with it into the promised land, Ezekiel chapter 20, verses 6 to 9. Israel was incapable of overcoming the consequences of the fall. Sin and death marked its life emphatically. Jesus Christ, as the sinless Son and the new Adam, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 45 to 47, destroyed the power of sin and death. The adoption of old Israel was spectacular. 
Egypt was confounded and shattered in a series of plagues of miraculous character. The birth of Jesus Christ, the natural Israel of God, was miraculous also, the ultimate and unique miracle of the Incarnation. The third phase of this typology is our own adoption into Christ as sons of God. St. Paul declares in Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 to 7, But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because ye are sons, God hath sent forth the Spirit of his Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Wherefore, thou art no more a servant, but a son, and if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. Old Israel was heir to the promised land, Canaan. Jesus Christ is appointed heir of all things, by whom also he, God, made the worlds. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 2 The new Israel, the elect people in Christ, is also an heir, but the heirship, being in Christ, is to all things, and it is attended by the atonement. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 2 Old Israel's atonement, while real, was subordinate to Christ and a type of his work. New Israel's atonement rests on the accomplished work of Christ, who, when he had himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3 Because of the typology, there is a continuity between the three sons, old Israel as an adopted son, Christ as a natural and virgin-born son, and new Israel as the son adopted by grace in Christ. This means a continuity of both law and grace throughout the Bible. To deny grace is to deny salvation. To deny the law is to deny heirship. But this is precisely what the antinomians do. Thus, Cornelius R. Stam writes on the impossibility of obeying the Great Commission of Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 to 20. His reasons for this are that Israel has been set aside, but Israel continues in Christ and his people, who are the Israel of God, Galatians chapter 6, verse 16, and that it would bring in the fulfilment of Isaiah chapter 2, verses 1 to 3, not the forming of the body of Christ, if the Great Commission stands, which is the point of all scripture. Again, Stam holds that, If this were our commission, it would, as we have shown, put us and our hearers under the law of Moses, to which we must answer, we are for our sanctification, never for our justification. We are free from the law as an indictment and a death penalty, and we deny the Pharisaic use of it for supposed justification but never its necessity for our sanctification. Baptism is apparently rejected by Stam because he holds. This would take us back under a dispensation when, as we have seen, water baptism was required for the remission of sins. This would indeed make the cross of Christ of none effect. Apparently, Stam believes the cross was of none effect, during the years of apostolic baptizing. Moreover, baptism never remitted sins. It set forth the fact of Christ's remission of our sins, received by grace. Stam writes further, Preach the Gospel. To ascertain the content of this Gospel, we may not anticipate revelation and find answer in the Acts or Paul's epistles. These were not yet written. The term the gospel denotes prior reference 
Therefore, we must consider the preaching context and ask ourselves what gospel they had been preaching. When we do this, the answer is simple. They had been preaching the gospel of the kingdom. Matthew chapter 4 verse 23, chapter 9 verse 35, chapter 24 verse 14, Mark chapter 1 verse 14 and verse 15, Luke chapter 4 verse 43, chapter 8 verse 1, chapter 9 verse 2 and verse 60. And our Lord was now sending them forth to preach this same gospel for the king who had been crucified and was alive, raised from the dead to sit on the throne of David. And this is, in fact, what Peter preached under this commission. Acts chapter 2 verse 29 and verse 30, chapter 3 verses 10 to 21. The gospel of the grace of God was not revealed until years later. We cannot preach the quote-unquote gospel of Mark chapter 16 today, for the risen king was again rejected by his own nation and is a royal exile. Our message, unlike theirs, is an offer of reconciliation to Jews and Gentiles who have been alienated from God. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 13 to 21. This is a denial of typology. Christ and the new Israel of God are reduced to pale ghosts of the old Israel, whose fulfilment alone provides the goal of history. Moreover, Stam demands a radical break in history and a new revelation during the apostolic age, the most staggering of all breaks. Yet nowhere are we told that this great and dramatic change has taken place. Such a change should be the most obvious fact of Scripture, whereas it only appears in Schofield's ungodly notes. Finally, Stam has no sovereign God, only a defeated Christ, and it is not surprising that this school of antinomian heresy and blasphemy emphatically denies the Lordship of Christ, whom Scripture declares emphatically as Lord. Romans chapter 10 verse 9, 1 Corinthians chapter 12 verse 3, Revelation chapter 19, verse 17, etc. The coming of the king does not end in the defeat and the retreat of the king. Israel's rejection of Christ was not, stand to the contrary, the exile of the king, but the destruction and exile of the old Israel. When God declares, Out of Egypt have I called my son, Matthew chapter 2, verse 15. He declares that Christ, as the greater Moses, shall lead his people out of bondage into world conquest, so that, as heirs of all things in Christ, they shall reign with him. The birth of our Lord is thus a joyful word of victory. It declares the ordained continuity of grace and law and of God's Israel by adoption. We who were strangers and grafted into the chosen tree and some of the old branches are broken off. Romans chapter 11 verse 17 So that God's continuity and purpose be upheld. Having been called out of Egypt in Christ. To remain in Egypt means to deny Christ and to be no member of the adoption of grace. 